Welcome back, all you beautiful souls, to another episode of Aligned and Alive. I'm your host, Chrissy May, and today's guest is a remarkable human being who is a CPA by education, but an entrepreneur by exhilaration. After beating cancer, he chose to view his cancer journey as a gift and allow it to be the catalyst of what drives him today in helping others become financially free. He is the founder of the Affluence Blueprint and the Legacy Factor, best-selling author of The Entrepreneur's Solution, and host of the podcast, The Affluent Entrepreneur Show. He is a visionary financial expert, speaker, and entrepreneur with an unwavering dedication to empowering individuals and their businesses so they can live their full expressed lives by choice. When he is not inspiring others through speaking, training, or mentoring, he can be found working out, training in martial arts, or creating unforgettable memories with his beautiful wife, Stephanie, and their sheepadoodles, Budo and Samson. It is an honor to sit and share in conversation with Mel Abraham. Welcome to the show. Chrissy, so good to be here. Oh my God. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It is so great to connect again. And for those of you who don't know, Mel and I actually met at Chris Harder's roundtable in early April, which was an incredible mastermind with a group of high-level entrepreneurs. There was so much value in that experience. And so I'm just excited to connect again here on the masterpiece of all masterpieces that Mel created, which is called Building Your Money Machine. And I've been working, I've been speed reading my buns off, trying to blaze through this. So I'm halfway through, but uh, big congrats on this. I am just, it must be, be such a great feeling on your end. Oh my God. It, it really is. It just, it feels like it's this culmination of decades of a journey all put together in a way that hopefully serves. And it's just like, it, it gives me chills. When I first saw the print, and I saw Hay House on there, I go, oh, gosh, it's real. It's, you know. I got excited receiving it in the mail from Hay House. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm so excited for Mel. And just the part I've been reading, I mean, it's so simple that my 13-year-old nephew, Chase, could actually create a money machine because this it's so accessible. So before we dive in, as I always love doing, I would love for you to speak on your journey, your story a bit. It's pretty incredible very colorful and basically how you became an expert in making money. Yeah. You know, you would think that being a CPA, that I was educated as an expert in making money and building wealth. And no, nah. <laughs> it, it didn't do me any, I mean, it did me some good, but it really, it, it taught me the path to be an accountant. I figured out really quickly that the accountant spends all their days on a treadmill, running, 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 swapping hours for dollars. You got to use the timesheet. You got to get billable hours in and all that stuff. And I go, but wait a second, where do I get my time back? Where do I do this? And it really smacked me in the face in, well, 1996. My, I, I was a single full-time dad. I was taking care of my son, raising my son. He was five and a half years old when he came to live with me. And and I thought I was doing the right things because I was following the path that I was told to be on and, and building a business and building clients and getting cash flow and, and doing all the things I was supposed to do. And he came running in one day and said, Daddy, Daddy, I drew a picture of you at school today. And so I'm thinking I'm going to see a picture with me and him playing ball or at Disneyland or something. And I kneel down, I, I grab this picture and it's me and blue felt tip pen. And there I am standing in front of two computer screens with a phone in each ear and one on the desk ringing. And in a moment, a six-year-old just put a mirror to my soul to tell me that I was failing him, to tell me that, you know, he didn't see me as fun. He didn't see me as this, this person that was actually accessible to him. And, and that, that really ripped me apart to, to start to really ask myself, is it possible for the dream to build a business, to build a career, to impact other people's lives, and the gift of being a father to coexist? Um, and that's what started the exploration of how do we do this? And, and 
And probably the big aha from there was the fact that at some point I had to figure out a way to disconnect my ability to earn from the efforts to earn it. And that's the birth of the money machine, is that rather than be on the treadmill of a job or a career or on that, on that path where I'm swapping hours for dollars, I needed to find a way to use that to build something that allowed me to get my time back, that allowed me to live a life by choice. And, and so that was where the exploration started. And uh, it was literally at the hands of a six-year-old. And it's amazing when I, when I hear you speak right now, my mind is already going towards how that moment really helped you so much later in life that you didn't even realize. Like, yeah. for instance, when you, in 2019, when you were diagnosed with a, was it a baseball sized tumor on your bladder? Yeah, they, uh, they found a, what they thought was five centimeters. When they went in, it was seven and a half centimeters, uh, a tumor in my bladder. I, and it was, it was out of left field because I wasn't a smoker. I wasn't a drinker. No, my family ever had cancer. I wasn't, they said bladder cancer, average age 73. I like, unless mom lied on the birth certificate, I wasn't close. I'm like, why me? And so the one thing that came clear because they looked at me and they said, it's on top of the prostate. And that means that we might have to take the prostate out. We won't know until we get in there. We can't see the ureter on the right side. So we might have to put a tube and a bag into the kidney. And if it's bad, you could lose your bladder. And let's face it, it's cancer. So life is on the line. Now, so like everything was great. And then all of a sudden, in a moment, it got turned around. The, the one thing I knew was that, that I had to shut everything down. I had to battle this. I had to fight it. And I had to focus on it. It was the only thing in my life that from, 20, from June 13, 2019 on was, was to beat this, this little demon. And I knew I had to fight the cancer physically and mentally and psychologically and medically and uh, on all fronts. The thing I didn't have to do is I didn't have to fight it financially. And the reason I didn't have to fight it financially is because of the gift that was given to me when Jeremy drew that picture. And my journey to build that gave me the ability to shut things down, but still live our lives, to mm. know that we were okay, to have choice of doctors, to do the things. It was born at the hands of a six-year-old. It was given the importance at the hands of cancer. Ooh, I just got chills. Gosh, just amazing when you think about just the, the gifts we do receive along the way, if we take notice, right? Yeah, yeah. If we receive them, that's the most important part. So let's talk more about that because you were so deliberate in creating a plan from that moment. And I, I remember a clip a couple of days ago that caught my eye. I thought it was so interesting. 31% of millionaires built their wealth on an average income of $100,000 because they knew what to do with the money before they got it. They actually followed a plan, managing what they make and investing as much as possible, saved, invested, and built. This is a simple laid out formula that shows how anyone can create wealth. But this is interesting. 18% of people that are making 100K are still living paycheck to paycheck. And I actually thought that stat would have been much higher. I thought it had been more like 30, 40%. So in your humble opinion, what is the number one reason why most people can't execute and how can they shift into a state of becoming a money machine? Okay, this is a great question. And I can go a couple of ways, but I think the fundamental reason first is that we're not having conversations around money. I grew up in a house that they said, you know, it was like, it's impolite to talk about money. We had, we had a guy that we called an uncle, but he wasn't an uncle. And I just remember he would drive up in this cool car. I had no idea what kind of car it was back then, uh, but it was an Aston Martin. And he had a phone in the car before phones were like in. Like it was so long ago that you would pick up the phone and you would call a central operator and the operator would connect the call. That's how long ago it was. And I remember sitting at dinner with him, family there, everyone's there. And here I am going, how much do you make? <laughs> and like my mom almost <laughs> spit her food out. Like we're not supposed to talk about it. But here's, here's another statistic. 72%, 72% of, of people surveyed and studied by 
the American Psychological Association said that they're stressed about money. Okay, 22% said it was extreme stress. So if we have a quarter to two to three quarters of the population stressed, but we're told not to talk about it, how do we solve this problem? And, and so I think the first thing is to be willing to talk about it. That's one. The second thing is the realization, which is what you mentioned, is that it actually isn't complicated. Is we think that sometimes money is for someone else and it's complicated. I'm not a numbers person, but it doesn't have to be. And that's the thing that I started to realize is that difficult, it may not be easy depending on your age, stage, or circumstances, but it doesn't mean that it's complicated. It's still simple. And so just because something's difficult doesn't make it impossible. It just means that we have to do it. And so I think that if we start to talk about it, you start to see the simplicity. Now we just have to look at it and say, okay, here's the, the core element of wealth creation. It has nothing to do with money. That study showed it. It has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with behaviors, habits, and decisions that you make. And yes. when someone says, I, I, got, I got money issues, I said, no, you don't. You don't have money issues. And they look at me and go, you haven't seen my account. And I go, no, I don't need to. What you have is money symptoms. And they're symptoms of the behaviors and decisions from the past, which I don't say to be critical. I say to empower them to be able to get a chance to go, well, okay, so if I was given the recipe, if I was given the prescription to change my behaviors, and now I do that, I get different results. And that's what really drives wealth. And yet we are on that path primarily because we're not having conversations around it or the conversations we have aren't the ones that actually have withstood the test of time. And then we aren't willing to, make, to change our behaviors for the long term to make it a, a reality. Also good. And I keep thinking of this is why personal development is so important. You know, people think personal development is just personal development for, you know, X, Y, and Z, but it relates to every part of your life. It's not just financial, it's relational, it's spiritual. Every part of your beingness can benefit from personal development. And I love that you brought up the habit thing. I just spoke on that a couple episodes ago on developing habits. And one of them was, I think in the beginning, delayed gratification is a great example to you know, a good habit to develop when you're trying to build this, this whole financial freedom portfolio. And I'd like to talk about that. So what does that recipe look like? If you could put it into just a, a really simple box for people, like where could they start right now? Besides the obvious, and you know, I think a lot of people think calling a financial advisor and where do I start there? But if there's something they could do right now, where would you have them start? And I'm going to go with the example, because I think this is most Americans right now, or a lot of them, is credit card debt. That's a very big thing right now. So would you, would you have them start creating buckets? Like, what, is that, what does that plan really look like? So I have something that I talk about in the book called the Wealth Priority Ladder. Uh, here, here's the mistake that, that most of us make. If, if we had a business and you had a business and you were going to hire 10 people, and you bring 10 people in, they've been hired, and you sit them down in the conference room to welcome to the new company, and you say, listen, we do things differently here. You'll notice that I didn't give you a job title. I didn't give you a job description. I'm not giving you goals. I'm not giving you roles. I'm not giving you tasks, but I want to double the business in the next two years. Let's go have at it. <laughs> like, like the chance of success is zero. <laughs> just, it, it's not, not going to happen. But that's what we do with our money. We do not give our money a job description. Every single dollar that comes into our world needs to have a job description. And here's the most important part before it comes into our world. Because the tendency is that if I wait till the money is in my hands, temptation takes over. You start to see things on Instagram. That, that, oh, that's nice. Like I got a $900 coffee maker because I was on Instagram going, this is cool. I can order a coffee from my phone, you know? And so I'm not exempt from it, 
But the tendency, we got to remove temptation, especially with the barrage of what we're getting nowadays. And the way you do that is that you define what every dollar is going to do before it ever comes into your life. Whether it's for the mortgage, whether it's for rent, whether it's for clothing, transportation, all those things. You set it up from the beginning. Now, one of the benefits of doing it that way is let's say that you want to go out, you, you've already set aside $150 to go out to a nice dinner, celebratory dinner, whatever it is. You go out for, for a nice dinner, 150 bucks, you spend the $150. The difference between doing it deliberately, like I'm saying, and not, is if you didn't do it, you would come home, you know it's on a credit card, you know that it's, it's something spent, but you would be questioning yourself. There would be guilt, there would be shame, there would be emotions around it. When we do it the way I'm saying, all that goes away because it was in the plan. It was already defined. So we, we start to rid ourselves of guilt and shame and all those emotions around the money in that process. And so that's the general thing. Now, specifically, what do, what do we do? I want you to focus on safety first, growth second. And why I say it that way is I need to make sure that you have a foundation of safety. So if something goes awry or something doesn't go the way we want, you're not in a ditch somewhere that you, you, you're you taking care of. So one of the first things that I want to do is give you a cushion, a cash cushion. We talk about it as a comfort fund and it's 1500 bucks or one month's expenses. It's not your emergency fund. It is simply there for, for breathing room should something unexpected happen in the interim as you're building something. And a lot of clients will, will look at it and go, oh, how do I get there? One of the first things I, I tell people to do is look around your house. Mm. I bet there's stuff that you're not using that you can put on Facebook Marketplace. Just get that money. Now we put it into a high yield savings account. Okay, you'll get about 5% right now. It's fully insured. We just put it in a high yield savings account for now. Now, if, if the transmission goes out or something short term happens, you're not going further into debt. So if we have credit card debt, the first thing we got to do is stop digging. The way we stop digging is make sure we have the cushion because otherwise I'm going deeper in the hole. Mm. Now, once we do that, there's two things I want to do at this next, what I call this, this second phase. It's different than what a lot of people say to do. Most people will tell you, get out of credit card debt first before you do anything else. Mathematically, that's the right thing to do, okay? So I I acknowledge that. Mathematically, it's the right thing to do because you will reduce your interest expense and you'll get out of credit card debt uh, quicker. The problem is your debt management muscle is a different muscle group than your wealth creation muscle. And that means that we're delaying the exercising of the wealth creation muscle or habits. So what Mm -hmm. I tell people to do is that, let's say you have $500 that you want, that you can use towards, towards your credit cards. I would tell you, and you can decide on the percentage, these are guidelines, but you could, you could say, I'm gonna put $450, okay? towards paying down my credit card debt. And we'll talk about how that can happen. And the remaining $50, I'm gonna put into a high yield cash account and then I'll start investing it uh, down the road. And what I'm trying to do is I'm not worried about the amount, I'm worried about the habit. And so now I'm paying down credit card debt, yes, a little slower, but I'm also exercising the, the mindset and the habit of putting money away for the future. And so now when that credit card debt gets paid off, everything's going towards the future. And Mm -hmm. I don't have to learn new habits because I already have the habit in place. I would do both at the same time. Oh, that is so refreshing to hear because every financial advisor or expert I've heard, at least online, always will say, pay down all credit card debt, you know, take all your cash and just, you know, pay it down because of what you just mentioned, the interest rate, you want to, de- you know what, you want to delete that. But then I always think too, I mean, playing devil's ab- advocate here for a bit, when an opportunity arises that will allow you to create cash flow, 
yet all your funds are assigned to the plan, do you make exceptions and leverage in that situation to feed the opportunity? And then the follow-up question to this is how much should one leverage, especially when they have multiple businesses to access? So where's that fine line drawn? Because I understand there's this plan. And I think the plan's a great plan that you just paved out. So the, I'm not, I'm also not one of those that believes all debt's the devil. Mm. Okay. I do think that there's two kinds of debt, destructive debt and productive debt. Destructive debt is the debt that we're going into to finance our current lifestyle. They're for consumables. It's stuff that doesn't last. So it could be a luxury vacation. It could be a big screen TV. It could be any of that type of stuff. That's destructive debt. That's consumables. That I don't like. And I'm fine if you're using the credit card and paying it off. But a word of caution, statistics show that even doing that, you will spend 30% more. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about why that happens. There's productive debt, though. Productive debt, which is what you were talking about, is the debt that I take on that is going to increase cash flow or increase wealth over time. It's the mortgage on a rental property. It's buying a piece of equipment for efficiency in a business. It's putting Facebook ads on a credit card in an effort to make sure that you get a multiple of that spend back in sales. That's constructive debt, okay? It needs to be managed. It can't be reckless, but I'm okay with that because the motivator behind it is something that's going to give us an ROI. It's not to finance our our lifestyle that we can't afford today, okay? And why I say, you know, this, this idea of, of credit cards, the reason that we've got credit cards is not for credit. They're, they're, credit card companies are really astute marketers. Here's what they know. The more they can remove the friction from our buying decisions, the more we buy. This is why even if we pay off the credit card, we'll still overspend if we're not careful. I mean, today I can just tap, you know, it's easy to buy. The challenge is because we don't have that buying friction, we buy more and we buy stuff that we don't really need. That maybe is momentary pleasures. What I tell people to do, because here's one thing I know, because there's, there's folks out there that say, Hey, you got to live on ramen and mac and cheese until you do this. And I, and I, I understand the, the philosophy behind it, but here's the other side of it. I know that if you are miserable, if you're not enjoying the path to financial freedom, you're not going to enjoy the destination of financial freedom. What I tell my clients to do is I said, I want you to find two, maybe three life's joy points. And what I mean by that is deep, visceral, long-term, sustainable joy. Maybe it's travel. Maybe it's something else, but whatever it is for you, put that in the plan. Make sure that that you're taking you're taking and giving it some level of priority, so you're actually having some joy along the journey. And the rest of it are momentary pleasures that mm, you put aside. But again, what we're doing is removing temptation because now we take the things that actually matter to us more. And we make sure that we have those funded. And so we get a chance to still ha enjoy the journey if we, mm -hmm. if we build it that way. Mm, so good. It reminds me of another clip. I've just been stalking you on Instagram lately <laughs> because you have so many powerful clips you've been posting. I love it. The one you mentioned about what is the purpose for money? And where does your happiness really come from? Because money is only a result, not a purpose. And yet how you choose to experience life and choices you get to make. So ultimately living from a space of richness. I loved that clip you talked on, you spoke on because what you just mentioned was so true. And I feel that I hear that from a lot of people, especially is that they have to be in this prison, this in order to you know, create this magnitude, this money machine, when you just painted it so poignantly, it's creating this lifestyle around it. Here's the other thought that I, I think gets lost in this. And I, and I love that you brought this up. So I was having a conversation with, with someone from my publisher 
who said, you know, I don't know that I'm ever going to be able to buy a house. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I, I don't know that I can afford it. Okay. Why do you want to buy a house? He says, what's the American dream? I said, I know it's the American dream. Here's my question. Is it your dream? And he goes, oh, I never thought about that. Everything we do with our money should be driven by our dream, by our vision, not someone else's, not your degree, not your career, not your profession, not society, not TikTok, not social media, not media, but to sit down and say, what do I really want? Is it the tent in Montana? Is it the yacht in Monaco? Okay. If there's a question, I'm taking the yacht. <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. You know, but we don't take the time to actually define it. And if you're in a committed relationship as a couple to define it for both of you and say, this is what matters to us. And now allow that because we start with the vision of life, our life, that vision will help us define the plan. That plan will give us the strategy and the strategy will then turn around and give us the tactics. The tactics will then define the action steps. But we don't do that. We, we tend to not do that. And then we find out there's so many people that I've met over the years that have tremendously wealthy bank accounts. I mean, like, holy moly. But they live horribly bankrupt lives mm. because they're not experiencing life. They're right. not feeling life. They're not in their joy points. And so if I'm going to be working to build a money machine to, to build wealth and do those things, and at the same time, I'm not enjoying it, why am I doing it? I mean, it doesn't make sense. No, it's, it, it's a life of unfulfillment, truly, yeah. when, you, when you look at the bigger picture. I was just having a vision of just marriages and relationships in general and how this really is such a big topic, you know, going into really or being in a relationship and navigating one. And, you know, if you do have different, this is why lifestyle interests are so important if you're compatible, because if not, ultimately that's going to really put a burden on your money machine making skills inside of a committed relationship. So I think it's super important to get crystal clear when you're going into that that dating scene. You it's should why find out someone's lifestyle. <laughs> oh my God. It is why in the back of the book, I have an appendix that says conversation starters for couples. Ooh, see, I haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah. I love I, that. I have uh, an appendix for uh, conversation starters for couples and conversation starters for our youth. Ooh, both really important. Are they at the end notes? I'm in it right now. Yeah, they're in the it. appendices at the back. Okay. All right. I'm going to look over those. Yeah. That's see now you're also just a financial expert in in the dating game too, the money dating <laughs> game. <laughs> you know, who would have known? I saw a statistic. I don't know how true it is, but it I know it's up there. They said it's money is the second leading cause of divorce. Yeah. It's not it's not money that's the cause of divorce. It's the inability to communicate around it that is. And I, I go back to here's here's how we typically communicate when I when I've seen couples do this. They kind of say, honey, why did you spend so much at the salon? Or why did you go and get that technology? We're actually talking about tactics and we're doing it with criticism and judgment. Where we need to have conversations is back up at the vision for our life that I talked about. Because if we've agreed to the big vision and we've defined the plan and we've agreed there, the plan will tell us what we have to do and what our roles are. And now when we have a conversation, it's back up there and not down in the weeds where there's judgment, criticism, and resistance. It'll never go well there. And I no, see that. That's... I see it all, all the time. Now, I am not a relationship expert. It took me 50 <laughs> years to find my wife. <laughs> you did it, though. I did. See? I did. And there's another, here's another great point, you know, going off of that. It's never too late. I love how you, you really talk about whether it was on your, your video a couple of days ago on speaking on Henry, I believe who's the 18 year old who ended up, you know, really committing to his Roth IRA with his money. 
or it's someone in their 70s right now. It's never too late. I think a lot of people have that misconception that the narrative that plays out that I'm it's I'm too old now. It's just now I can't do anything about it, which is not true. I did a call last night and I had a handful of people in their 60s. Now I'll be 63 this year. I act 12, according to my wife. <laughs> so she, it hurt. My day's not complete unless she rolls her eyes at me and say, Are you ever going to grow up? I said, no, <laughs> same answer as yesterday. <laughs> you know, but I had a number of people that were in their 60s, 64, 65, 63. And they were going, oh my gosh. And I go, but let's just ask this question. What's the alternative? If we don't try, if we don't build, even if we got 20% of the way there, because the alternative is what? In this country, Social Security? Social mm-hmm. Security benefits, $2,200, okay? The poverty line in 2023 was 1,700 bucks. You're just above poverty. It's not a solution. What's the other solution? Our kids' couch? No. So it's not an excuse to not try. There's plenty of stories of people that started in their 60s or in their 70s and all of a sudden built something. And now they're in a whole different game. And we're living so much longer these days. Even at 60, you kind of go, hey, you got a couple decades in you. With a lot of life, too. Yeah. It's not like it's not back to years ago where 60, 70 was old. It's young still, depending on your lifestyle and choices you make. But- we have a guy here who's 90, I think he's 93. And he still walks down like a mile and, and walks back. Like, we'll see him. And every once in a while, we'll pick him up and say, come on. You know, it worries <laughs> us. This 90-year-old guy on, on Pacific Coast Highway, you know. But, but he's just, he's got this vibrancy and he's still going. And I go, you know, so, so it's just not that old. Maybe it's also because I'm in my 60s now. I'm going, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be here a while. Yeah. Well, you have a lot of life in you. That's for sure. You can see it and feel it. I'd like to talk a little bit quickly before we move on. And it does go a little bit with what you kind of brought up, but the Affluent Blueprint program that you offer, because I started looking into it and I thought it was just such a wealth of information. So if you could speak a bit on that and how anyone can shift their current state into one of liberation, if you kind of take a step by step on what that process looks like. Yeah. So. Um, this is actually a training program that, that I do that literally walks you through some of the implementation of some of the stuff in the book, but really breaks it, breaks it down for you. We will go through what I call four gateways on our journey to financial freedom. And the, and the, and the mistake is that, that we put a number out there and you'll, you'll hear people in the personal finance space say, well, what's your freedom number? Okay. Mm-hmm. That's like, what's your sign? I just... Okay, what does it mean? Okay, but here's the thing. If I come up with some big number, arbitrarily, say it's 10 million, and say I have nothing right now, how achievable does it feel? It's like, there's no way that I'm gonna get to 10 million, not in my lifetime, I've never, no one's, but here's the challenge. One, we think that our growth to wealth is linear. It's not, it's exponential. Do you know that if I put $10,000 away a year at 8%, it will take 20 and a half years, 20.6 years to get to a half a million dollars. But it'll only take seven and a half years to double it. So now I got to a million. I got another half million in seven and a half years. So in one third of the time, I doubled the money. And the reason is that is that it's an exponential growth. We don't realize that in our thinking. We think it's linear. And so 10 mm-hmm. million seems like a long ways away. But it's not once we have the machine. That's why the subtitle is getting your money to work harder for you than you did for it. Once we get past what I call the wealth flat line, then the money starts to go and grow. But the only way to get past that wealth flat line is time. We have to be in the game. We can't be on the sidelines. We can't be in the stands. We have to be on the field playing the game of wealth if we want to win the game of wealth. So that's the thing. So now if I have a $10 million number, I look at it and say, there's four gateways I want you to work through. And this is what we'll do. We do in, in the program also and break it all down is that the first is I want to build enough of a machine that's going to give you what I call financial stability. That is 
money, cash flow from the machine that's going to pay your, your, your needs, your survival. Roof, food, medical, clothing, transportation. That's it. No mani petties, no technology, no Netflix, nothing. All right, it's bare bones, but you are stable. You're good. Once we get stability, now we move towards security. Security allows you to build a machine. Now you build the machine where it's covering all those other expenses. So throw the mani petties in the technology and the Netflix and all the other, the country club, all that stuff. Now we're paying our current expenses. That means that financial security in our book, that gateway means that we can keep our current lifestyle. Mm. Okay. Then there's financial independence, the third gateway. That is when we build enough of a machine that it replaces 100% of our income. So to, to look at it this way, say our survival was $2,000 a month. You're not living in California on that, just so yeah, clear. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay? 2000 bucks a month, that means that the stab stability, I just got to generate 2000 bucks a month. But if I add in all the other things like Netflix and all that stuff, say it's $3,000 a month. So financial security is at $3,000 a month. But I'm making 5000 a month. So financial independence is $5,000 a month. But now financial freedom is a different game. Financial freedom is that you build a machine that gives you and funds the vision you have for your life. And that is usually the biggest game you're going to play. But in order to get there, I like putting milestones on, in and gateways like this of stability, security, and independence to go, oh, I'm on path. I'm on path because I think we fall off the journey because we're not seeing progress. I came from the martial arts, you know, 40 plus years and lived in Japan. And one of the reasons we use a belt system here, because they didn't do it in Japan, in Western society, is so we can be reminded of how far we've come. And so when we can continually see us making progress, it keeps us going, it keeps us going. And that's why we put these things in and have systems and processes and scorecards and, and checklists to constantly check in with yourself to make sure that you know you're on the journey. You're measuring things in a simple way to make sure that you're on the path. Mm, so simple. It makes me think of the book Atomic Habits yeah. by James Clear. You know, the 1% daily. I mean, we think we, we want to achieve whatever goal that looks like, right? For your physical goal or, or whatever that looks like. And so it's just that 1% every single day that's going to stack over time that's going to create a whole different life for you in no time. I mean, you look back a year later and you're like, oh my gosh, I, I accumulated so much. But at the time, it seems so minuscule. You, know, you don't, you're so right. You don't realize, I, look, I didn't come from money. I was, my, my dad came here at 17 years old with nothing to go to school. Got an education, became an engineer, was in the aerospace industry. So he did okay, but we weren't living a lavish lifestyle. And we, we you know, we drove used cars. We shared. I mean, we lived in the same house that they bought in 1958, never upgraded. Did So I came from those kinds of roots. So it wasn't handed to me. And I built, I lost, I rebuilt and continued. If you would have asked me decades ago, would you be living on the beach where you're at, the life that you have? I mean, it would have been such a distant dream that I don't know that I would have believed that it was a reality. But staying engaged and staying in the game and looking backwards now, I go, we have more power and more ability to affect our life in the long term than we give ourselves credit to credit for. Right. No, it's so true. I so what are your what are your ways, your favorite ways to really start building money. You, I think, you know, a little bit about my background is in real estate. And so, you know, I've never been the one who goes, oh, stocks and EFTs and all this stuff and Bitcoin. I just know the game of real estate and I've made a lot of people money in real estate. And so I know that's a very great avenue to, you know, to exercise that opportunity. in. I just looked at two seller carries down the street from me in Paradise Valley a couple of days ago and thought, you know, very little money down. The interest rate was great. Like it makes sense to me. I don't understand the other avenues. And so like, what are some go-to, or do you think in all have a little bit of interest in every bit of them? 
In the wealth prior ladder, I kind of have a hierarchy. So, and remember, I'm driven by safety first, growth second. So real estate's in there. It's not the first thing I tell people to go to. I love real estate, okay? The only reason that I tell people it's not the first place I want them to stop unless they have such an experience with it. And here's the only reason I say this. Let's say that we have 50,000 bucks and I can go into a property and I end up getting one property for 50,000. And this happened to a friend. They bought a building and the building was fine. They decide that they want to do some roof work. They bring the contractor in. Contractor says, oh, there's asbestos in this roof. We're going to have to clear it all out. And it was a, an office building, um, you know, and that meant that they also had to strip out the tenants. So it was $150,000 spend and no rents and then have to re-rent it. And the mortgage had to get paid. And so my concern with real estate at the beginning is if we don't have the liquidity to carry it, if we have a bad tenant, a bad repair, or, or uh, it's not rented, is that now we put ourselves in jeopardy potentially. And, that, and so that's why I look at it and I say, I, I do it as a second stage kind of uh, investment when I have some critical mass to sustain myself at the beginning. Now, once you have, let's say you have a couple of properties that are cash flowing and all that stuff, you have actually a cushion there that allows you the, the latitude. It's really at the beginning that, I, that cause, causes me concern. So at the beginning, I tell people, I want to go into something that I know will go up long term, that gives you diversification, that gives you liquidity, and that gives you some stability. And so I put people, I try to get people into index funds and ETFs because that same 50,000 can be split up into two or three funds and up across 3,000 different companies that over time will do eight, nine percent, not huge returns, but it's consistent over the long term. And if you look at statistics, anything beyond 10 years, there's 94% of the time it's up. Eight out of 10 years, the market's up. So that's where I'll start people because it gives liquidity, it gives diversification, it reduces risk. Accessibility is, is easier because they, if they have $500, they can get started with 500, they can get started with 1,000, and we can start exercising the muscle and, and doing, doing that. So mm. that's usually where I will, will start people is to do it that way. For the same reason, I don't like individual stocks. I don't like things like crypto. I don't like any of the stuff that has the potential for loss or volatility at the beginning because I can't sustain it. Now, do I have individual stocks? I do, I absolutely do. But it's a small sliver and it's after I had critical mass. If it goes, here's the thing we know. Stock market always recovers. Real estate always recovers, absent a nuclear disaster, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Stock market never goes to zero. Real estate never goes to zero, okay? Individual stock, though, can go to zero. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say we don't do individual stocks at the beginning. We do a basket because if one stock goes to zero, I have... 2,999 others that I might have or 500 or whatever it is to keep me going. And the same thing, you know, I don't know about crypto and I'm not a, I'm not a, a Bitcoin or crypto person, but I do know that it is, it is the level of volatility in it is too high, especially for people starting out, in my opinion. And I believe that if your investments are giving you an adrenaline rush, this is the wrong kind of investments. Yeah. So if someone has $10,000 to start, they would enlist in a financial advisor. Is that correct? Someone they were referred to or so, and then start that process, what you just recommended? Actually, I would tell you to follow what I, what I guide in the book, because I don't think you need a financial advisor oh. at the beginning. Here's why. Keep it simple. Okay. I'm going to buy one index fund or one ETF or two or three, or four. That's it. I don't need an advisor to do So what are you going to do? You're going to open a brokerage account. Could be at any discount broker. So it's going to be at Vanguard, Schwab, Fidelity, any of those discount brokers. I avoid any broker 
that uses gamification. I know they want to make it fun. Here's the problem. When they bring gamification in, they boost your emotions. And when you boost your emotions, your financial intellect goes down. That's how I got mm -hmm. in the Ponzi scheme. Okay? He got my emotions going. Okay? I went from smart to straight to stupid. Lost one third of everything. Okay? Different story. But so open the brokerage account. Fund it. Okay? And if you're not sure where to fund it right now, just put the cash into a high yield savings account as a temporary parking spot. You'll get 5% for the time being and, and just get your, your, your fee wet. You can then decide, I'm going to do one fund, two fund, three fund, or four funds. What do I mean by that? The easiest thing, and I talk about it in the book, the easiest thing for people to do is to just buy a target date index fund. Here's what that means. As we're recording this, we're in 2024. Let's just say that I don't need the money for 30 years. So let's push it out to 2055. Every major broker, Vanguard, they have these funds that are target date funds. Low cost, low fee. I'm not paying a, a professional to do this. I literally will say, what's your, the 2055 fund? And what they do is they put the portfolio together and they manage it to 2055. So it's aggressive today and gets more conservative as we get closer. So you pick one thing and they manage it while you're getting acclimated and more understanding, and then you can adjust it later. But the simple thing to do, get in the game, do it with a target date fund. It's diversified. Like if you look at a, a Vanguard 2055 fund, it's actually four different funds that they build for you and then they manage it. And as it gets more and more conservative as you get closer to 2055, and you don't have to make all these decisions. You don't need a financial advisor. One of the other ways to do it is to, you go to a robo-advisor, you answer the questions, they'll make the recommendations, but you're not paying a financial advisor all these fees at the starting point. I have a financial advising team, okay? So I do pay fees, in full disclosure, but it's not to pick necessarily the investments, it's for all the other stuff that we do and everything. The more, just like the buying decision, the more friction there is in your investing, like, oh, now I got to figure out who's the right advisor and what questions to ask. No, the more we can get rid of that friction and put your hands on that steering wheel, the, the easier, the better it's going to be. And literally, it's open a brokerage account, fund it, buy a target date fund to start or, or buy two or three funds, uh, you know, a total stock market fund and a total bond fund and a, and a mid cap, you know, you can buy two or three funds and do that. And you don't have to do it all at once. You just, you can buy a thousand dollars a month, a thousand dollars a week, a you know, whatever, and build it over time. And while you're doing it, you're learning, you're growing and you're skilling up. Oh, I love that. It's so easy when you just paint it and you can start as low as $500, right? 500 bucks. Is that you said? I mean, you can do 500, some of them have minimums, you know, this is why you stay away from mutual funds and all that, because they, they actually have more fees and all that. But you, you'll look at the minimums in there, but a lot of them have very little minimums. So you can get in. And if, if you're not at the minimum, then you put it to a high yield savings account until you're at the minimum. And then once you're in, then you can invest at whatever increments. As I'm listening to you, I have to tell you what's coming up for me emotionally because, you know, I'm in the spirituality space and all that health and wellness. And I just felt an overwhelming sense of peace as you're speaking to me right now, thinking if I can just commit to this really small thing, think of $500. People spend that on the most ridiculous things, you know, purses and clothing and whatever, just stuff they don't really need. There's this sense of just even like internally security and peace that just comes within knowing that you're setting yourself up for a fruitful future and being able to navigate now the present moment with a lot more grace and ease. It just feels good. As I mean, I'm just feeling the whole energy of it and how productive we can be as human beings in the full experience of life when we just get in the game, yeah. do what you just recommended, which is so simplistic. And that way we don't have to even worry about it. We know we're following the, that 1% every single, whatever it is, week or month yeah. to help secure a greater opportunity for ourselves down the road. It doesn't take a lot to make a lot. 
the more time we have, the less money we need. The less time we have, the more money you need. It's like $800 a month, so $200 a week, at over 30 years at 8%, is $1.2 million. Yeah. We just got to get in the game and stay in the game. Yep. So that's the key thing, too. Don't touch it. <laughs> Don't touch it. Once it's, yeah, once it's in, it's in. It's Remember the flat line I talked about? Yeah. You got to get in there. You got to play the game. Use the time. Get outside the flat line. Okay. The problem is, is if you don't and you either stop or cash out like I did, you have to go back to zero. You got to start again. Oof. Painful. So, that sounds painful. It is painful. <laughs> but when you don't know, when I left. You don't know. When I left my consulting job and went to Japan to, to live for a period of time, I cashed out my 401k. Like, hey, whatever. I cashed it out. I just figured I'm young. What do I care? But you know how much money, how much wealth I gave up by doing that? But I had no idea. Now, I was a CPA. I'm an accountant. Clueless. <laughs> I was like, come on. <laughs> well, you went through that experience. So you could help us, exactly. all of us, to have a different perspective. Yeah. One last thing before I before we run into our little fire round, I have a fire list of questions for you at the very end. Sweet. Um, the, one, the one last topic I wanted to touch on because I thought it was so such a great perspective when you mentioned retirement versus peace of mind. Retirement is this putting it off in the future and peace of mind is looking at the present moment today. And I thought that was such a great perspective shift because I'll raise my hand high in this one. When I think of retirement, you think of, I have plenty of time. I have plenty of time. And just the word alone has that tonality that's a little, you know, low vibe, if you will. So can you speak more on that? I felt that was just really helpful and in, in shifting in perspective. I was looking at it from the perspective. First, uh, I, there's this whole question of what does retirement really mean? OK, I, where am I retiring to? I, I just like I don't know that I'm ever going to stop doing things. So am I searching for the this like arbitrary line in the sand of time that says now go live your golden years it just didn't it just didn't make sense to me versus sitting back saying does that mean that i'm not supposed to enjoy the time all the way up to the golden years that i should be stressed and then at that point is when i when i do it but how many times do we feel and we see someone that gets to that point of retirement and they think they're going to do nothing they actually do nothing, their health declines, and they didn't get a chance to enjoy it. And because they bifurcated, they, they split their life into these categories. This is my living. This is what I'm doing. This is this. And then when I get to retirement, I get to do nothing. Now, I, I think that we ought to be living the whole way. I look at it and say, there's three freedoms. Financial freedom is actually the most rudimentary based level freedom that we could ask for. And we don't want financial freedom. We want what it gives us, and it's the other two freedoms it gives us. The, the first freedom is time freedom, to be able to have choice, to be able to have options, to be able to say, I can control my time. I think we would be better served to measure our wealth in time than dollars. To mm. sit back and say, how much of my, the moments of my life do I have agency over? Do I have control over? Now you'll see how rich you are, how rich of a feeling you are. The third and, the, and, and I think the, the primary freedom is mind freedom, peace of mind, to, to know that, hey, we're okay. After I was diagnosed with a cancer, I was scared of the, I was scared of the cancer. I'd be lying to say I wasn't, but I wasn't scared of what I was going to have to go through, the pain, all that stuff. But what really scared me was I wasn't done living. I was enjoying life. I was loving life. I was, you know, but what I didn't, I wasn't scared of was, is my wife, my son, the grandkids weren't born at the time, but is the, are the people I love, the missions I, I'm behind, the movements that matter, are they going to be okay? And I could sit back and say, okay, they're okay. My brother, my nephew, all they're all okay. So that, again, 
cleared the space for me to focus on fighting and healing. And so I think that our desire, our ability to strip away the friction, the conflict, and the things that we normally see with money, the vitriol, the demonizing, all of that stuff, and to see it for what it is. And that is, it's a tool to facilitate a life. That's it. To facilitate living a rich life, not stuff, but experiencing it, feeling it fully, fully expressed each and every day. Because I don't believe legacy is something we build. I don't believe that legacy is something we build and then we give to someone. I think legacy is something we live each and every day and that we interact with people and the legacy is what we leave in someone. And when I look at my son and I look at what he is as a, as a husband, as a father, as a, as, as, as a man, that's my proudest success. That's my legacy. Okay? The money facilitated my ability to get behind missions, to do the things that I love to do by choice. But that's not my legacy. My legacy is something bigger. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where peace of mind comes from. Woo! Woo, woo, woo! I'm like Brad Leia over here dropping bombs, like pushing <laughs> the target. That was incredible. You are truly the definition of a servant leader. Like when I just sit here and share in this beautiful conversation, you are, we are blessed to have you and have you have written this book. And I am just so grateful for everyone who gets a hand, gets their hand on a copy. I can't wait to finish the book. It's my mission this weekend to finish it. So thank you. Thank you for sharing in everything. But before we go, I like to do a little round. It's a fire round. Mel has no idea what the questions are. I don't. It's what comes first to mind. There, there and is I always... peace of mind right out the window right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right, right on that poignant end right there. So I, I like to name these rounds a little cheeky. And I, I named this one Making Moves with Mel. All right. Because we are definitely making some money moves with Mel on your side. And we're going to get a glimpse into a few things that he doesn't even know about. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. First one, what was your very first job? My very first job, I, was, I worked in a clothing store in retail. Actually, no. My very first job it was, was literally 11 years old. I was doing magic shows for, for kids' birthday parties. That was my first dose of entrepreneurship. I was just going to add that because I remember reading that in the book, and then I read something about being a clown. That yeah, was interesting. I, you know, you, this, is, this is an example of knowing your market. <laughs> Okay, I did it as a clown. Well, kids are scared of clowns. So my whole audience was crying. <laughs> <laughs> clowns are scary. <laughs> Where is your favorite place to vacation? Oh, man. It's one of two places, the Caribbean or Italy. Ooh, I'm right there with you. What does your morning routine look like? I'm up at 4 a.m., 4.15. I spend a little time with my, myself and, and my dog, Budo, and then I will, I'll be at the gym by, you know, usually thinking, writing, you know, and just in, in gratitude, I will go to the gym and work out for a good hour and 15 minutes or so, come back, Budo and I, and now Samson, end up on the beach for 45 minutes to an hour. Every morning, I come back, uh, do my shake, get washed up, and I'm I'm in the saddle and ready to go for, at that point. Oof, I love the intentionality. What is your go-to advice on multiplying money fast? Oh, man. Here's where, where I think that you, you got to look at is One, you got to start with one income stream. You got to get it rolling good. If we delude ourselves to try to get multiple income streams at the same time, we will do none of them justice. So get one running and use that as the stepping stone to get another one running. And so, and the idea here isn't about, I don't like the term passive income because passive means set it, kind of the feeling of set it, forget it. But our relationship with money is a relationship. And if you take a passive approach to relationships, they'll wither and die. So 
I look at so it as good. leverage. So the, the additional income streams, I want to leverage your time. Remember, I want to disconnect my efforts from my earnings. So I have my earnings, my work, that brings in the lion's share of the money at the beginning. But then I use that to build my money machine, which was built on asset-based income streams like real estate and, and, and that. Residual income streams like my book and, and courses and things like that and portfolio income streams. That's what I would do. Mm, so good. What is the most embarrassing moment of your life so far? Oh, my gosh. There's been so many, but I think probably the most embarrassing one. Um, I do a lot of speaking and I was doing a presentation. This was a webinar for an, a national association that gave me the Lifetime Achievement Award, which is an association's nice way of saying, you've been in the business too long, get out, okay? But I sit down at the computer with GoTo uh, webinar. I strap in, I put my headphones on, and I start this. This is a, an association of accountants, attorneys, and financial planners. So we're a conservative association. It's a 9 a.m. thing. I'm just showing my slides and I'm talking, that's all. So I figure, all right, I roll out of bed, I have my Superman pajama bottoms on, no shirt, and I start, the, I start the webinar. And about a minute in, I see the chat, and it says, Mel's naked. He, he's not wearing a shirt. And I look, and the light on the webcam's on. Somehow, I turn the webcam on, which wasn't supposed to be on, and I'm sitting there completely topless in front of this National Association of Accountants, Attorneys, and Financial Planners, and uh, 200 plus of them. So that was probably one of my most embarrassing moments. Oh my God. Do you have the recorded footage still? I, we still, we still have it. Um, <laughs> and the interesting thing is I'm actually keynote, keynoting their conference again this year. They, they keep asking me back, but they tell me to wear clothes. So. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> How do you stay present? Um, I think that for me, it's, it's prioritizing the things that matter. When Jeremy drew that picture of me, one of the, and being really intentional, one of the things that I did, and, and this is kind of the way I run the plan for money too, is we built a calendar. And that calendar had red zones in it for Jeremy. So at six years old, he now knew that all the red zones on the calendar were his. They would not be moved. It's him and I, and that's it. And he also knew that any other color on the calendar, he could turn red in a moment if he needed it. And, and so I try to do that with my, with my life and my days by prioritizing things. At the end of the, like in November of last year, my wife and I sat down and looked at the calendar for, for this year. We blocked, just like I did with Jeremy, blocked out our times, our vacations and everything already done, not movable. It's done. It's in the calendar. So we are already looking forward to those things and we have them in place. And then I, then I look at my days and the same thing and say, what are the priorities? And I block, I just block, block my, my time out. So good. What is your proudest accomplishment personally or professionally? Seeing the man that my, my son has become. Ooh. Yeah. I see him as a father. I think he's far better father than I was. And as a husband and in he is he's living proof you can transcend the genetics and the upbringing <laughs> is there anything we haven't covered that you want to say before we wrap this episode yeah i think that um i think that each of us were were put here with a gift a gift that we had to nurture a gift that we are called to bring to the world and sometimes life gets in the way, money gets in the way. And, I, and, and the reason that we want the financial freedom is so we can nurture the gift. Because when we nurture the gift, our job is to build, build it, build it, build it as big as possible and to get to those last days, those last moments of our life where our toes are on the graveside. And to get there without regret, without resentments, to be sweaty, to be dirty, to be tired, to be exhausted, to look back at all the people you served, all the people you loved, all the people you shared life with and say, I did it my way. I'm mm -hmm. good to go. And you take that gift and you give it back to someone else and say, it's your turn now. And you take it the next step and you jump in. I think that's what we're here to do. 
to live a life that outlives us. And when we live each moment and make it matter, our life will outlive us. Powerful. I felt every bit of that. Very powerful. Mel, you are remarkable. You are amazing. The work you continue to do is just, I honor you. I see you for everything you're doing. And I just applaud you to keep on going and to keep touching lives the way you are and building your money machine. This is going to impact so many people across the world. It launches June 11th. June 11th. 2024. That's the date, June 11th. But you can pre-order your copy now. And of course, as always, I have you hooked up. Everything is in the show notes. All you have to do is click the link and press order. And Building Your Money Machine will be right at your door. Right after June 11th. Just a couple couple short weeks away. Oh my gosh. That's it. That's exciting. It's, it's so it's exciting. It's around the corner. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time. I, I look forward to seeing more to come and your next book, your third one. You're going to have a third one coming out, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting, not that I'm putting the pressure on or anything, but. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you, wonderful. Chris, for having me and for this conversation. This is a wonderful conversation. And, and I, I, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.